In case you're here by accident, because most of you know this, right? A little background on Lindy. Uh, she is an opinion writer for the New York Times, the author of the best-selling memoir, Shrill, and executive producer of the acclaimed Hulu adaptation starring the ever so delightful A.D. Bryant. Lindy, right. Lindy is also a co-founder of the Shout Your Abortion movement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With her signature wit and uniquely incendiary voice, The Witches Are Coming lays out a grand theory of America that explains why Trump's election was, in many ways, a foregone conclusion. Whether it be the notion overheard since the earliest movements of the Me Too movement that feminism has gone too far, or the instance that holding someone accountable for their actions amounts to a witch hunt, this book's this book points out the lies many have chosen to believe and the often unexpected figures who have furthered them. In the end, far too few err on the side of care, a sentiment I wish more people would take to heart, and too many fail to live in the truth. As Abby Jacobson, creator of Broad City and author of I Might Regret This notes, in this time of great frustration, this collection is a clearing in the woods to meet, to reflect, to dance, and to cackle around the fire. Or my favorite quote from Samantha Irby, author of We Are Never Meeting in Real Life. If you haven't read it, read it. Get me a broom. <laughs> that being said, uh, shall we get on with the main event? Uh, please join me in warmly welcoming Lindy West. Hello. Sorry for doing this gross social media influencing, but I <laughs> gotta be me, gotta influence. <laughs> um, what are you all doing here? <laughs> There's so many of you. Thank you so much for coming. Wow. Oh boy. Wrote a lot of goofy shit in this book that I'm <laughs> gonna read to you now. Um, but I feel like I should do a caveat at the beginning because um, I feel like probably all of you like must work for the government <laughs> or something. And I just want to um, be very clear that I don't know anything. And <laughs> please don't ask me policy questions, <laughs> um, or I will. Um, I don't know, claw my way through the floor and um, down into the earth and die. Um, no, I mean, it's fine, but like, I always feel like, I always try to like emphasize when I do interviews or public events that um, truly, and I can spin this as like part of my charm, just some lady, <laughs> like just some lady, I don't know, some lady with opinions feel like I, I, uh, uh, my skill is um, to absorb what's happening around me and then sort of uh, process and regurgitate it as an every woman. <laughs> Let's just, and that really gets me off the hook for uh, not knowing anything. So I um, just want to say that because I feel like all of you are probably smarter than me and know lots of things. Um, so yeah, I wrote this book. It's called The Witches Are Coming. Um, just a little background on the title, um, although probably you can extrapolate, I don't know. But so you know how um, everything is so bad? <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> like, you know how um, the president um, keeps doing crimes <laughs> and then doing being like getting a microphone and being like so I just wanted to confirm that I did crimes <laughs> it's really weird right like it's a really surreal place to live and part of the like part of the way that that functions is that um, there's this magic, like this kind of witchcraft that, that 
he, I mean, not to give him too much credit, but there, there is he, him, the guy. We don't need to. We, at my house, we call 2016 election the incident. <laughs> but there's this kind of magic in it of, of just, um, A, just saying whatever you want to be true, and then people are like, yeah, okay. Like two seconds ago, you you said um, something, and then what's an example? What's like the best thing you said recently? Uh, but I mean, like, okay, sure. Uh, two seconds ago, he he he's like, yeah, I, yeah, I asked Ukraine to dig up dirt on the Bidens, and then you're like, did you? And he's like, I never, no, I no, I never said that, and I didn't tell you that I said it just now. Like, it's like, I mean, I, that didn't even happen. But like, history is or reality is just being rewritten in front of our eyes. And um, one one sort of manifestation of that is, um, although this predates Trump, is that uh, <laughs> women get called witches, um, you know, as a sort of silencing tactic, a way to silence and discredit us. And then also, when a man does crime and then has like one shred of accountability or consequence, then suddenly also we are witch hunters and they are being witch hunted. And I feel like that's not fair. <laughs> like, well, how come you get to be a witch when it's useful, but then we have to be a witch when it's bad to be a witch? Anyway, so I'm reclaiming both. Which is my right. And I don't see why anyone could get mad at me. Because, like, you said it. You said I'm a witch, so fine. And you said I'm a, wi I'm a witch hunting you, so fine. I'm a witch, and I'm hunting you. Which is... It's, like, really satisfying, even when... <laughs> You're very aware that you have no power um, to just say real aggressive things. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, hunt I'm hunting you. That's a scary ass thing to say. So anyway, um, I wrote this book and it's about, you know, sort of living in a, trying to, trying to live in reality when it's being actively rewritten around you by, by bad people. Um, and this chapter speaks to that in various ways. Um, and it's about specifically the notion of likability and the way that we apply that to men. Spoiler, we don't. Uh, no one has ever asked if a man is likable. Literally the least likable human being on earth became the president of the United States. I mean, and that's like, okay, it's easy to like roast Trump. But I just mean, like, seriously, though. Like, really, like, really, really, like, profoundly unlikable, like, has redefined, like, before any of this even happened, like, that was, like, the grossest guy on earth. Whatever. I'm sorry. It's so boring. It's, like, so easy to roast. It's so boring. I, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not here to pander and be, like, Trump bad. Um, it's, like, who cares, but... He's just like sucks. <laughs> like he's just like fucking he's like he's just like a goober who like doesn't know anything and like what what? All right. So that I I spent 7 minutes on that. That was good for all of us. So anyway, I'm going to read this chapter about likability. <laughs> okay. This chapter is called <clears throat> This chapter is called, Ted Bundy was not charming. Are you high? <laughs> and like, I'm from Seattle. I'm from Seattle. My parents, my parents are from Seattle. We all went to the same high school, not at the same time. And... You, growing up in Seattle, people talk about frickin' Ted Bundy constantly. 
It's like, oh, Ted Bundy, like, murdered, bludgeoned a woman in this alley. Oh, the legend of Ted Bundy, the charisma king. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Okay, whatever. So I just want to, like, maybe I feel more passionately about this because I feel like I grew up being, like, literally indoctrinated into this idea that Ted Bundy was a charm machine. <sighs> Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, Ted Bundy was not charming. Are you high? Um, trigger warning on the beginning of this chapter where I talk about murder for, like, so many pages. <laughs> so sorry. Um, for as long as I can remember, I've been terrified that a man was going to sneak into my house and murder me. Actually, convinced might be a more accurate word than terrified, but I don't want to say convinced because I am at the same time totally dismissive of the supernatural and extremely superstitious. I don't think that jinxing things is real, but I do not jinx things. <laughs> Why risk it? Just a few weeks ago, I was sitting in my hotel lobby in New York City, reading Jason Manzukas' Wikipedia entry, and then Jason Manzukas walked by me! <laughs> Who knows what's possible? Plus, if you say things such as, I'm convinced I will get serial killed, and then by coincidence, you do get serial killed, it becomes a whole thing in your dateline. <laughs> Keith Morrison is like, a beautiful young nymph, haunted by visions of being serial killed. <laughs> but they were only visions, right? Wrong. <laughs> Good thing that I did that. Um, <laughs> Three asides on Dateline real quick. One, everyone knows this, but it was either the husband, the ex-husband, or someone who wanted to fuck her, but she turned him down. <laughs> White cops always wanted to be someone's possible ties to the Russian mob because their brother sold a guy named Casimir a boat in 1992, and it is never, ever that. It is always, it, wait, it is, I skipped an important sentence. It is never a global human trafficking ring. <laughs> Eat it, white guys, you love weird sex murder. Number two, the only foolproof way to murder your wife is to take her hiking and then very gently hip check her off a cliff. <laughs> you cannot hip check her too hard because the scientists can tell the trajectory. <laughs> the scientists always measure. Three, all Dateline correspondents are my children. But here is my ranking of them in order of how much I love my children. I stole that construction from my friend Megs. It's here in the audience. Keith Morrison. Josh Mankiewicz. Andrea Canning. Dennis Murphy. Sorry, Dennis. You're still my child. I love you. You're still my son. She's just my fourth favorite son. Okay. So I have to say... It was a little annoying when, in January 2019, everyone on Earth suddenly became Ted Bundy experts because of Netflix's four-part documentary series, Conversations with a Killer, The Ted Bundy Tapes. Like, excuse me, some of us have had the Wikipedia page, list of serial killers by number of victims, bookmarked since 2006. <laughs> and it was only published in 2005. Unrelated, but also a hot, hot read. List of fatal bear attacks in North America by decade. <laughs> Likewise, the great true crime podcast boom of Trump's America has been both an irritant and a boon. Like, yes, it's my food, feed me my food, but also please acknowledge and honor my lifelong interest in sexual knife crime. This is like all intro. Haven't remotely gotten to the thesis of the chapter yet. <laughs> Something just occurred to me. Do cisgender men not spend absolutely every moment of their lives obsessed with the possibility of home invasion? Do they sleep soundly all through the night, even if there is a noise? <laughs> Do they notice if they get home and the porch light is off, but they are certain they turned the porch light on before they left? Do they think about giving up their lovely house, their porch, their garden for a high-rise apartment because there are fewer points of entry? 
Do they consider going home from work early because they can't stop wondering if the wooden dowel in the basement window track has somehow come askew? Do they rehearse protocols for which heavy dresser they will shove in front of the bedroom door if they hear someone creaking up the hallway and lie awake at night wondering how thick particle board would need to be to stop bullets? What about particle board, a layer of folded sweaters, and then another piece of particle board with a faux wood grain laminate? How easily and how far can one man shove one door, one fat woman, and one piece of an Ikea bedroom set? Could I survive a jump out of a second story window? Should I aim for the tree or try to avoid the tree? Do fat people bounce better or hit harder? Oh. Straight white cisgender men love to file serial killers under some darker subcategory of white male genius. It's easier to be titillated when fear is an abstraction. Ooh, BTK installed security systems so he could disarm them later. Isn't that smart? Gary Ridgway eluded the cops for 20 years. Bundy wore a fake cast, diabolical. No, you dick lickers. They were... <laughs> Sorry. They were, they were fucking pathetic, opportunistic incel losers who leveraged the staggering confidence that our society confers upon bare minimum white men in order to get away with obliterating the lives of sexual objects they despise because they could not own them. Much like Ada Lovelace, the inventor of the fucking computer. It was interesting to observe the renewed national conversation about Bundy in light of another national obsession incubating at the time, the early stirrings of the 2020 presidential campaign. Watching otherwise rational human beings rhapsodize about Bundy's charm and brilliance while furrowing their brows over Elizabeth Warren's dubious likability <laughs> creates a particularly American kind of whiplash. The prevailing Bundy narrative has always hammered away at how handsome and charismatic the man was, but one would think that in 2019, if Me Too brown shirts truly have the death grip on pop culture and justice that the whinging class claims we do, someone might have red flagged the canonization of a shitty rapist failure who murdered at least 30 women. Ted Bundy was a mediocre student whom no one liked, who failed at everything he ever tried to do except for exploiting women's socialization as caregivers in order to put them into vulnerable situations so he could take away their one single precious exquisite life. Elizabeth Warren just put herself through Rutgers Law School with a toddler at home, held endowed professor professorships at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law and Harvard Law School, became perhaps the most influential expert on bankruptcy law in the country, has been a U.S. Senator since 2012, and is now arguably the most principled and policy-driven candidate in the fight to wrest power from a profligate dictator and lead Americans to help save our dying planet. Ugh, off-putting. I hate it when my mommy makes me brush my teeth. <laughs> Far more likably, Ted Bundy pretended to have a broken arm so he could rape, bludgeon, shoot, and stab women. <laughs> Things that don't make a white man unlikable. Murdering, stealing everyone's money, grabbing women by the pussy, cult leading, making everyone in your cult commit suicide with you, Genocide, being a DJ. <laughs> Things that do make a woman unlikable. Voice, body, hair, shoes, kids, no kids, sex, no sex, money, no money, inhale, exhale, Metabolize food, shed skin cells, use muscles to move bones around, do anything, die. Uh. Likeability is a con, and we're all falling for it. 
I watched Netflix and Hulu's dueling documentaries on the social media mega scam Fire Festival. <laughs> Ooh. The same week that I got that Ted Bundy documentary in my craw. And look, I am not saying that Fire Festival CEO Billy McFarland is like a serial killer because he lured hundreds of nubile young influencers to a remote island with no food or shelter and then tooted off on a golden jet ski and left them to be eaten by wild pigs. The lawyer says, I have to clarify, that he did not literally do that. Just mostly. He mostly did literally, mostly kind of do that. Okay, I am saying that McFarland is like a serial killer because he is exactly as likable as Ted Bundy, and yet somehow I had to watch two entire documentaries <laughs> about how charming and charismatic he is. I'm sorry, is everyone on MDMA? And can I please have some? <laughs> Billy McFarland is the most obvious, bumbling, con artist dumbass ever birthed by the universe. He's the guy who never helps on the group project. He's the bully's least memorable henchman. He's that kind of American rich kid who doesn't bother to learn more than one vowel. He looks like the producers spread peanut butter on his tongue and then had his audio dubbed by a frat guy halfway through dying of alcohol poisoning. He seems to be, to put it charitably, barely alive. If we're all made of star stuff, He's from the butt part of the star. <laughs> Sorry to be a mean bitch, but I am so fucking sick, fucking violently ill, of having to watch good people be conned by smug simpletons who couldn't beat a dog at Candyland. Ted Bundy and Billy McFarland are both more charming than Donald Trump, and that boner pratfalled his way into becoming the most powerful man on earth? That guy? That guy is who brought us down? One malicious side effect of American's bootstrap ethos, itself just a massive grift to empower the snickering rich, is that it conditions people to cheer at deregulation, to beg and plead for the removal of consumer protections. We are literally asking to be conned. We are a smorgasbord for the most unscrupulous and the least deserving. Being a giant fucking sucker is as American as school shootings. Sorry. <laughs> That's not supposed to be a comedy sentence, <laughs> in case you feel like I'm being flippant. The past few decades have been a tug of war over the benefit of the doubt. Black Lives Matter demands that white America adjust its assumptions about the inherent goodness of cops, about who looks like a criminal and who looks like a fine boy having a bad mental health day. Me Too demands that we re-examine what credibility looks like, who gets to define it and meet it out, who gets to stride through the world assuming that they have it. Institutional benefit of the doubt is monstrously powerful. Any lie becomes an incantation, conjuring itself into truth. This is the foundation of Donald Trump's power. I'm the least racist person you'll ever meet. I am a handsome law student. The Fire Festival is real and Kendall Jenner will be there. <laughs> to fund Fire Festival, Billy McFarland called people on the phone and asked for millions of dollars. And people were like, sure. To not get caught, Ted Bundy just had to exist. Multiple acquaintances reported him based on the police sketch, his brown Volkswagen, and his shitty personality. But cops thought that a handsome, no, uh, law student, he got bored and stopped going, couldn't possibly be a murderer. I mean, you guys, the Michael Scott Paper Company was just a supply closet filled with cheese balls, <laughs> and it got a multi-million dollar buyout from Dunder Mifflin. Like, men, would it kill you to say thank you once in a while? There's a famous moment from the Bundy trial in 1979, a trial in which Bundy disrupted the proceedings repeatedly with outlandish disrespect to the court and to his victims when Judge Edward D. Cowart of Dade County, Florida delivered Bundy's death sentence. <clears throat> Quote, The court finds that both of these killings were indeed heinous, atrocious, and cruel, 
and that they were extremely wicked, shockingly evil, vile, and the product of a design to inflict a high degree of pain and utter indifference to human life. This court, independent of, but in agreement with, the advisory sentence rendered by the jury, does hereby impose the death penalty upon the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy. It is further ordered that on such scheduled date that you be put to death by a current of electricity sufficient to cause your immediate death, and such current of electricity shall continue to pass through your body until you are dead. <clears throat> okay, I don't believe in the death penalty, but otherwise, seems pretty on point. Then, the judge continued, take care of yourself, young man. I say that to you sincerely, take care of yourself. It is an utter tragedy for this court to see such a total waste of humanity, I think, as I've experienced in this courtroom. You're a bright young man. You'd have made a good lawyer. <laughs> and, and, I would have loved to have you practice in front of me, but you went another way, partner. <laughs> you went another way, partner. I don't feel any animosity toward you. I want you to know that. Take care of yourself. <laughs> to recap, <laughs> women just live in life going to college, having brown hair, swimming, helping the injured. Ted Bundy murders 30 women at least because his pee-pee scrunched from being a massive shitty failure. The legal system, Bundy, you are a great man and a great lawyer and could be our greatest president if I'm being honest, but unfortunately, I gotta sentence you to death on account of all the murder and whatnot. Sorry, buddy, dang. I wish I could hire you as my son. And heck, you should be doing my job, partner. P.S., you my hero. <laughs> yeah, it, it happened in 1979. Um, I'm still mad. I wasn't alive yet, but I was, I was mad. I was angry in the, wherever you hang out before you're born, before you're conceived. In, in my, in the star stuff. Okay. I wonder how many of the women Bundy murdered would have made good lawyers. I wonder how many female and minority lawyers Judge Cowart mentored in his lifetime. This anecdote is often held up as evidence of Bundy's charisma. Even the judge sentencing him to death was seduced by that smirk, that finger wave. But it is the most blatant, overwhelming evidence we have for the opposite. Men don't need charisma to succeed. It doesn't matter if men are likable because men are people who do things, who don't have to ask first whose potential has value even after it is squandered. On the other hand, women. Is there such a thing as a likable woman? Can you think of one? And if she exists, could she be anything but the ultimate manifestation of everything we hate about the water we swim in, everything we're forced to be, Likeability in a sexist, racist culture is not objective. It's compulsory femininity, the gender binary, invisible labor, whiteness, smallness, sweetness. It's letting them do it. If someone is universally likable, I don't trust that person. That's the opposite of politics. I don't want a candidate that the alt-right likes. I don't want to have anything in common with George Zimmerman. A person's standard of likability is a reflection of his beliefs, and unfortunately, in this country, a whole lot of people believe that Donald Trump is not a racist shart in an eight-foot tie who is unqualified for literally every job except lie down. <laughs> so, no, excuse me. We will not play likability anymore. It's an endless runner, a game with no progress and no finish line that women especially, are expected to chase that keeps us from doing the real work, accruing the real power. Chasing likability has been one of women's biggest setbacks by design. I don't know that rejecting likability will get us anywhere, but I know that, that embracing it has gotten us nowhere. 
Which is something we call a woman who demands the benefit of the doubt, who speaks the truth, who punctures the con, who kills your joy if your joy is killing. A witch has power, and power in women isn't likable, it's ugly, cartoonish. But to not assert our power, even if we fail, is to let them do it. This new truth-telling, this witchcraft of ours, by definition cannot be likable. We cannot pander or wait for consensus. The world is too big and complicated and rigged. We are saying the things that the people don't like, the only truly edgy things. That's the point. Someone will always pop up to say, you would be more effective if you were nicer. You would have a more receptive audience if you adjusted your tone. You catch more flies with honey. Well, I don't want flies. <laughs> the most likable woman in the world is crawling with fucking flies. Thank you. Thank you. That's my Ted Bundy chapter. So, okay, so now we have 25 minutes for Q&A, and I'm going to A all your cues. <laughs> we got two microphones. You can come stand in the aisles, and we're just going to go back and forth. And if no, if no one comes up after you, I will, t I will rank my favorite Dorito flavors. <laughs> so let's not have that. Hello. Hi, Lindy. When will you return to the New York Times? And of the candidates who say they'll eliminate the Hyde Amendment, which really will, and why should we shout our abortion if we'll be doxxed? Okay, I found that for some reason really hard to hear. Could you I'm, say it one more time? I don't think it's your fault. I think it's the acoustics because I'm because we're under this dome. Could you say it just slowly, one more time slowly? When will you return to the New York Times? Oh, when will I return? And of the candidates who say they'll eliminate the Hyde Amendment, which do you think really what will, and why should we shout our abortion if we'll be doxxed? Okay, great questions. Um, uh, I need to return to the New York Times as soon as possible. I, I took a hiatus to make season one of Shrill, and then as soon as, thank you. Um, and then as soon as that was over, I had to write this book very frantically. And then literally before I even finished the book, we had to start writing season two. And then they overlapped, which is hell. And then, um, then what happened? Then we shot season, basically, and then I started to have free time again. And I was like, oh, writing columns is hard. I remember it now. Um, and so now I basically like, when will I return? Like soon, it's, I'm in trouble. Like, <laughs> I, got, I gotta go, I gotta get back on it. It's, it's really nice to not have to engage deeply with politics on a daily basis, <laughs> you know? Uh, I've been watching a lot of guys' grocery games, um, which you can read about in this, in this book. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 know, I know that my absence has been noted and people are mad at me, That's, I, I agree. Um, I don't know the answer to the question about the Hyde Amendment, but um, I, I'm voting for Liz. Um, and why should we shout our abortion if we're gonna be doxxed? You shouldn't. Uh, only, only shout your abortion if you feel like you can do it safely and like you, you know, have the kind of support system and community where that's a possibility for you. It's not a directive, it's just um, a platform and a sort of space to, to do that if you want to. I choose to talk about my abortion constantly because I know that not everyone can um, and that a lot of people face actual peril if they do, um, depending on where you live, depending on what you know your family life is like. And so, you know, I live in Seattle, my family has always been pro-choice. Um, there's very little risk for me. I mean, like, and I have been doxxed. My address is on the internet. I've been absolutely threatened with death. But I, I don't know. It seems, no one, it's fine. I seem to be still alive. So not that, <laughs> not to downplay, because obviously anti-choice people kill people. But um, it, it hasn't crossed a line where I personally feel unsafe, so I choose to keep doing it. But um, no, no, I, I absolutely don't think that, that this is some sort of compulsory 
movement that everyone needs to participate in. In fact, the whole purpose of it is that not everyone feels safe. Um, oh, my earring has gone wild. Um, you know, not everyone can talk about their abortion, and that's why I talk about it um, too much to the point where people are like, okay, we know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, yes, I mean, that, I don't know, that's it. That's my answer. Yes. Hi. Thanks so much for coming to DC. Oh my God. Thank you for coming to see me. Congrats on season two of Shrill being either finishing or under production. Season two of Shrill comes out January 24th. It's really good. I was wondering if you could share with us, um, is Annie's project or trajectory on Shrill season two quasi-autobiographical as season one was, or was it, does she take on her own life in the oh, show? Oh, that's a nice question. Um, she, it, uh, it, we're mostly getting into the realm of fiction at this point, um, which has been really fun for me. Like, it's kind of a relief to not be like, oh, like every, you know, there were a lot of moments in season one where I was like, why did I do this? <laughs> like, why did I write dialogue for the dad that my real dad used to say to me? Um, you know, and, and Annie, because she's a creation of me and 80 and the, the writing team, she is, uh, she's not me, she's not 80, she is a, this, this fiction that we made up, and, and that's actually really fun. It gives you so much room to, to take it wherever you want to go. Um, but there certainly is still, there are definitely multiple plot lines from season two that are at least inspired from my by my life and um, things that I've written. And, you know, it does follow Annie's career as she becomes, a, you know, a more established writer and tries to build her career. And, like, it's all, it is, a lot of it is taken from, from my experience, but it's fictionalized. And it's really funny and it's really good. And you should all watch it. Thank you. Hi. Hello. How are you? Fantastic. Never better. So I have a very DC question for you. If oh. you were to be the President of the United States, who would be your dream girl power cabinet? Oh my God. <laughs> That's so stressful. <laughs> First of all, do not elect me President of the United States. <laughs> not qualified. <laughs> not qualified. Uh... Okay, I gotta go. Um, have you guys seen that clip from Billy on the Street where he's like, name a woman, name a woman, and the girl can't name a woman? That's how I feel right now. I mean, okay, so it's like, okay, because if I say any, like, politicians, then it's like, well, they should just be the president. Why am I the president? Can I not be the president? Can I be, like, the clown that lives in the basement? So I'll, let's do a different route. Well, you know, obviously we could go, like, I mean, this seems pandery. Oh, God, this is so hard. This is so hard. I mean, because you want, no, I can't. <laughs> I can think of like a million things that would create an applause break in a humiliating way where it's like, if I watched or listened to this podcast, I'd be like, oh, shut up. Oh, Beyonce. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. How about all of you? We can all be the, everyone, everyone in this room. Name a woman. I, there aren't any. I don't know. <laughs> people are in a cabinet? <laughs> 12? Literally don't know. Let's just keep going. Wait, which side is it? This side. Please, please, please take me out of this hell. Also, that's actually an incredible question, and I loved it. I just would need, like, several months to make my list. All right. Well, my question's terrible, so maybe you'll appreciate it more. No, um, so, it seems that at least in our side of culture and things, there's been somewhat of a shift with like body positivity and acceptance and stuff. And there are people who didn't used to be that way and now are better about it. And I wonder 
how you have reconciled, or if you have, and I'm thinking specifically of, of Dan Savage. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Dan, Dan and I are cool. Um, I mean, I never see him, but um, a backstory, if anyone cares, in Shrill, the book, I write about having like a, a fight with my boss, Dan Savage, at the time, who was my boss, uh, about fat people, because he, it was a long time ago, when this was like still very cool, he would like write on the blog and be like, fat people should go on diets, or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone would be like, <laughs> and, and then I was like, could you not do that? And then he was like, no, I'm going to do it. And then, and then I, and then I um, went completely wild and like um, wrote a manifesto and I posted it on the blog the, of the newspaper where he was my editor. Um, <laughs> and then we, and then it's fine. It was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> No, and then we, and then that becomes a plot line on Shrill, the show, um, loosely based. But um, it's a long time ago, and Dan and I had like some good conversations about it, and like I totally, and like in the in the um, intervening years, he has, you know, reached out to me when he has a question from a fat person in Savage Love. No, I mean like in a, in a way that you want the person to do. Like, okay, you know, don't just like wing it and try to answer this question in a dehumanizing way based on your own, you know, best guess. Um, and I appreciate that and I think he has tried to um, listen and grow. Um, and everyone was like um, trying to reignite our feud when Shrill the show came out. Um, and, and be like, you know, this boss character is clearly Dan Savage. And like, it's kind of, sort of, but like, no, it's not. It's an act, it, John Cameron Mitchell is playing a character written by a team of people who don't know Dan. It's not, you know, like the sort of structure of the relationship is similar, but um, the character, again, is a fiction. That's how TV works. Um, <laughs> but it was still like very awkward and I was very nervous about it. And like reporters were calling Dan to ask, you know, <laughs> How, how do you feel about this? What, what do you think? And um, and I had been terrified to run into him because we both still live in Seattle, which is very small. And um, then I and I was like, I should probably like send him an email. I don't know. You know, I hadn't talked to him in a couple years. And then um, on the way to South by Southwest, where we premiered season one of the show, uh, it, it was uh, on my flight. So <laughs> he was sitting in the seat directly in front of me. And so the Band-Aid was ripped off, and we had a lovely conversation, and I said, are you mad at me? And he was like, what is wrong with you? Of course not. Uh, congratulations, and good day. And then I guess we're friends, and everything's fine. Um, what was the question? Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the, the body positivity conversation is really complicated, and I tend to not use the, the phrase body positivity because I think it, it's a little off the mark in a couple different ways. I tend to talk about, um, you know, um, fat liberation or body liberation. Um, I think that poli keeping it politi politicized is really important. And also I think that demanding that people be po feel positively about their bodies is kind of um, um, mean. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it sets up another unrealistic standard for all of us to fail at. You know, not only do you have to live under under the, the crushing weight of all of these other beauty standards, you also, if you fail at them, and then you still have to live in the world of those beauty standards, but you also have to feel positive, you have to feel great about your body every single day, otherwise you are not body positive. Like, who wants, that's not, who does that help? Obviously it's good for people to exper sometimes experience the feeling of not hating their bodies, um, but I mean, that's more like body neutrality, which is another term that people use. Anyway. It's all really complicated because it's all being monetized and it's all being sort of um, ch like churned through the capitalism machine. And is is capitalism ever going to save us? No. So that's uh, you know. I, but but if I was 14 right now and I had like hundreds and hundreds of like fat beauty bloggers that I could follow on Instagram in bikinis, like Love and Life, would that have helped me? Absolutely. So. It's good and it's bad and it's complicated and you gotta, you gotta keep your eye on the ball. You gotta keep your eye on the politics of it and the, 
the fact that this is a social justice movement more than anything, it's not just about who gets to be on the cover of a magazine and who gets to be in the, the lotion ad, you know? Thank you. So. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Lindy, thank you for your work. Um, as a black woman, I, I've enjoyed your work, but I've gotten crap from my black friends about liking your work because you're not black. That's how it is. Um, I was all indignant when you were talking about Elizabeth Warren a, minute, a couple minutes ago and how you know women have to be prim, and, but black women have an additional burden of just like, let's just not even be loud. That indignity has died down as I've stood here because my feet hurt, but um, I, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, you know, Kamala Harris was running. I am in no way saying vote Kamala Harris, but I mean, I, I am saying she's fighting an additional fight in being a black woman with a loud voice. I was wondering what your thoughts were about how all women can lift up all women and not just, look, I like Elizabeth, but I'm just saying, how do you take off the tinge of being a minority and not, and having, your place should be on the ground as minority. You have no voice as minority. Per, per, repeatedly, if I speak up in my office, I'm the angry black woman. Just for saying the most basic thing, why don't we have better chairs? Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to your thoughts about that. Yeah. Uh, and my side note is I had super cool earrings on this evening and I lost one, so <gasps> I'm with you. <laughs> you had these same earrings? No, they were super cool lightning bolts, but I'm just saying, hold on to your earrings, that's all I'm saying. All right. <laughs> if everyone could please look around on the floor, try to find them as an earring. No, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. No, um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your question. And I, I mean, I, I try to acknowledge as often as possible in this book, especially when I'm talking about things like, you know, the power of anger and the power, you know, the importance of using your voice and speaking up even when it's unpopular, that that's not a level playing field and that that, um, you know, those those behaviors are, are racialized and they are um, stigmatized in a way that is absolutely... Um, uh, that reflects the same systems of, of, of privilege and power as, as everything else, you know. So obviously black women are disproportionately punished for all of these behaviors. And easy for me, uh, you know, to stand on this, a, a white woman with a platform and with a job where literally it's incentivized for me to be loud and opinionated because that's my job. Um, to be up here and say, Everyone should go out and express their anger and tell, you know, stand up for yourself in the workplace and tell everyone what you think about everything. Um, because it's not, that's not realistic. And it's, it's not realistic in a, in a really specific way for, for certain people. And so, um, throughout the book, I've tried, just like with Shout Your Abortion, tried to be really clear about the fact that this is not a directive. And it's more a directive for, the very for the privileged and powerful who do have the luxury of being able to be to express anger and express opinions and use their use our voices with relative safety to take full advantage of that space and and not just I went off the rails about this in an interview where I accidentally kind of said that the Goop conference was a hate group. Um, <laughs> but if you use your space only to advocate for issues that affect you directly, which is what white women tend to do, that's a white supremacist movement. That's, uh, that, and that's, it's, it's, well, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to applause break me, but like the, it's the same as what I was just sort of trying to ramble about with body positivity. If you're fighting for hourglass shaped size 14 white women to be on the cover of magazines, you're literally doing nothing. <laughs> like, because what we're talking about, if you're, if, if you're engaged in a social justice movement, the fight is for justice, which is absolutely inclusive to the end of the tent, whatever metaphor you want to use. Um, and if you're not doing that, you're not doing it, the movement at all, and you are, in fact, engaged in a discriminatory movement under the guise of 
justice. And I think it's really important for people like me who do have these extreme privileges to be able to have this platform to, I mean, obviously, like, be really vocal about all of this stuff. I don't know if I'm getting anywhere near an answer to this question. Like, the answer is, like, I totally agree. <laughs> um, and I, um, you know, I, okay, let's see. To reframe it a different way, like, I write about men. There's a chapter in here about, like, you know what would be great is if, like, my male colleagues would notice when someone is, um, is dismissing my ideas or is saying something sexist to me or um, is treating me, uh, you know, is not taking me seriously at work and they say something. Because you know what? It is stigmatized to speak up. And how about you carry some of that burden? And that's a, absolutely a duty of white women when we're talking about um, race in professional situations and in social situations and in political situations. So mm, I feel like I've rambled my way into a different universe, but, um, but no, I mean, I, you know, I, I get questions, I, I get questions from white women all the time, like, it's not fair, the infighting on the left and, like, people yell at me for not doing everything right. Yeah, and that's a gift that someone's giving you to do better, to all, I mean, it's a, such an easy, um, basic, <laughs> simple thing to do if you are a white person to always be open to always be permeable and teachable and to want to hear when you fucked up because that's someone doing something actually very kind for you telling you that you have fucked something up and that you have an opportunity to be better going forward if that's really the person that you want to be um, and people are so hung up on like being you know call out culture and cancel culture it's not fair it's not fair. People are criticizing me all the time for my bad behavior. And it's like, yeah, you're welcome. Like, I had one other thing I was going to say. What was it? Like, um, wait, I've almost got it. Don't, just stay with me. What was it? It was about white women again. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, crap, hold on. I have an ear infection, so that's my excuse for my brain not working. Um, hold on. Well, anyway, basically, like, oh, I know what it is. Because of this, like, sick, toxic culture that we live in, if you're a white person, especially a white man, but also if you're a white woman, you are raised to, like, conceive of yourself as default human being. And... It's really, it's really um, dangerous to live your life that way because it causes you to assume that your instincts are always right and that like your understanding of the world is correct and that there's nothing you don't know and that if like, things are as you perceive them. And that is absolutely false and you need to constantly, constantly be cognizant of that. And it's literally like, Nothing. It's the least you can do. Like, it's, it's you know, it's, you, there's so much you should be doing beyond that, which involves, like, leaving your house and using your body <laughs> to change the world around you. Um, but bare minimum, oh, my God, like, listen and don't assume that you know everything. Um, that's my answer. I don't know. I, it's a, you don't, I don't deserve applause. I, you know, it's, yeah. I, not, if if you're a white lady and you feel, if you're a white lady, just like remember that you're a white lady and like just like try harder. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't know. The, I really don't want applause for any of that um, because it's again like it's literally the least that I could do. I have this podium and I get to write books and it's ridiculous. Yes, hello. Hi, Hi Linda, you Seattle guy, Roger Ferris. Um, I, I knew you when you were little. Yeah, are you Emily Ferris's father? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was impressed when you were a little girl. You were great. And oh, that's still. so nice. <laughs> but uh, thank I, you. I, I think on behalf of this whole group, I want to thank you uh, for 
your courage, but your willingness to be out there and to say these things and be political and be strong and, and also to lecture us a little bit about how we could do better. And I love that. And, and I loved the book that I just read nonstop because Emily gave me a copy. Oh, and, that's <laughs> nice. And um, now I'll sit down, but I want to give you, a, since you brought up that awful monster, Ted, um, who used to live across the street from where I live now. But anyway. See? <laughs> he's, he's everywhere in Seattle. Yeah. Well, Seattle, or, used, Seattle used to be four people, and now there are many more, but I knew, I knew Seattle when there were three people. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is a trivia question for you about Ted. Okay. Sorry. And, and you don't have to answer it because... Good, that's it, good. Because the answer would be, duh. Uh, <laughs> I, I know you well enough from your writing now. But the question is, when he was a, a young college student, so charming and all, um, did he uh, volunteer and work hard for that very passionate group in Seattle, the Students for a Democratic Society, or was he a member of the Young Republicans? That rocked. Will you t tell Emily that I say hi? <laughs> what a small world. I'm so glad. I like, I, don't, I literally like, never mind. Like, we're talking like elementary school. I know, it's adorable. Um, <laughs> yes, hello. Oh. Hi, we're just going to take two more questions. Hi. Sorry. Um, mine's kind of half question, um, half statement. He stole my thunder a little bit. I wanted to say thank you. Um, you've had a remarkable and profound experience, uh, impact on the person that I love the most in this world's life. Um, and that just means so much to me to see how she's grown and blossomed um, from the words that she's read from you. Um, so I just want to say thank you. And I wanted to know, how does it feel to know that you've had such a profound impact on, on people's lives. Oh, um, thank you so much. Um, no, I mean, um, I mean, of course there's nothing better than, than hearing that you made someone feel a little bit less alone or made someone feel a little stronger or, or helped, not made, but helped someone find that place inside of themselves. And, um, and I really relate to it because all the stuff that I write about is just stuff that I needed to read when I was younger. So I like fully <laughs> know what that feels like. And other people did that for me. Um, um, at the same time, like I uh, sort of speaking to the two questions ago, like I, the, it, it, I, ha I have it really easy. And like, I'm really lucky to have this job and to have this platform and to, to live in relative safety and to be able to, um, you know, say things that make people mad at me and, and go back to my really solid support system. And can I, um, can I say, you do have it easy, but you're also incredibly brave. Like, the nice. things that you have done, not everyone could do or else they would be doing them. So, <laughs> well, you should remember okay. that. Well, we can argue about how brave I am. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I went, I was in Memphis and, um, uh, yeah, which was amazing. I'd never been there before. I had the best time. And there's an incredible, um, abortion clinic, reproductive health clinic there called Choices. And, um, they are amazing. Um, they have a birthing center. They have a midwifery program. They're like, you know, basically the only, the only organization doing like full spectrum pregnancy care in the whole state. And they're an abortion clinic, and they're constantly protested by people who supposedly care about babies. Um, and they, they invited me to their gala, and they gave me the Bravery Award. And I was like, <laughs> y'all, <laughs> um, you literally risk um, death to go to work. Um, and I am a blogger who <laughs> lives on my couch in Seattle, and, um, I, and I sit around thinking about ranking Dorito flavors. So <laughs> I'm totally honored. Um, but no, I mean, it, it's, it's I, what, I mean, what a, what a cool life I get to have. What a gift, you know? Um, 
And, and okay, and I say all that self-deprecating stuff, but it, like it is, like it would be for anyone, it is, it's really hard to have like, you know, a thousand strangers in a day email you that like you're a fat pig who should go die. Um, like it sucks, just kind of sucks, like objectively sucks. And um, it's, it's hard in a lot of ways. It's really hard to write about your own life, you know, to do the sort of really vulnerable writing that I especially did in Shrill and then um, just extravagantly avoided doing in this book because I'm exhausted um, and I feel very overexposed right now. Um, and so that, so, Hearing stories like that and hearing from people um, is the is the only thing that is what makes it worth it. And also, well, and also like again, you know, I if you have real convictions and you have the opportunity to have a platform like mine, and you know, I I only ever wanted to write jokes and like be a goof, but once I started to become kind of politically aware and, and to think about my place in the world and to think critically about the systems that we live in, it's like, there's not, it's not really optional. You know, it's not an option to not be political and to not um, you say what, ne what you think needs to be said as loudly as you can and I don't know. But yeah, it's, there is literally, it's like addictive to hear from people that that your work meant something to them and that they're a little bit more free because of it or they're a little bit stronger. I mean, like, that's just the most beautiful feeling in the world because I know what it feels like. So, yeah, thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Um, this might be too personal of a question. So eh, if it is, don't feel worry. Free it's, to I'm sure it's answer. fine. <laughs> I want to apologize to the two that didn't get to ask the questions. I know, I'm so sorry. You can ask me if you. Yeah. Come in the line of, and we can talk. This really affects my day-to-day -day -day life, so I was hoping you would answer the question of, uh, can you rank your favorite Doritos flavors? Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yes. I got this. It's hard, though. I actually, okay. But get ready. Get ready for some controversy. <laughs> Number one, are you ready? You're all going to boo me. <laughs> Number one, spicy sweet chili. <laughs> they are so good. Sorry. I don't make the rules. I didn't invent the formula. They fucking rock. <laughs> and then... This is like the eternal, I mean, how could, I don't, I was, I sat for probably 20 minutes yesterday and tried to think of what's better, nacho cheese or Cool Ranch. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know. It's unanswerable, it's unanswerable. No, it's unanswerable. <laughs> They are, they are, they are tied in a, in, in, in such a, you know, deep way. They are two sides, the two sides of life. And then, then all the other ones, I don't know, all those, those spicy nacho is, uh, it's not spicy and not enough nacho. I don't know, I guess there's like jalapeno, which I never encounter. And then of course at the bottom, plain? Have you ever even seen those? You run into them once in a while and you're, okay, if you're me, you're like, what's this yellow Dorito bag, a new flavor? And then you grab it and it's like plain. It's, which is just a tortilla chip. A food with which I have no problem. But somehow if it's a Dorito, this is blasphemy, and I want to kick it straight to hell. How do we feel about that? Did I, did I forget any Dorito flavors that are important? There's only three important ones. Spicy sweet chili, nacho. I guess maybe nacho has a tiny edge over Cool Ranch. Taco from like the 80s, right? That they brought back. It's okay. Um, 
All right, that's my time. Um, I'm gonna be up here sitting at a table. There's some kind of system that someone will teach you if you wanna come say hi. And thank you, I really, thank you all so much for coming and listening to me. It's very bizarre that you did so. I'm very eternally grateful. Thank you all so, so, so much.